scene. Uh, Jim Friedel in Hoboken uh, said it appeared to bank sharply and mm -hmm. smash directly, perhaps purposefully, into... Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, God. There's another one. Oh. Oh, my goodness, there's another this one. This seems to be on purpose. Oh, my goodness. Is now you... Plane? Now it's obvious, I think, that uh, th there's a second... So, again, reactions, live reactions from 9-11, commentators on television, cable outlets, news outlets, describing what they were seeing before their very eyes. You hear the shock. You hear the horror as they realize the truth of the matter is that America was under attack. Number to call if you want to share your memories of 9-11 with us, 888-589-8840, 888-589-8840. Number to call if you want to share with us where you were when you discovered what happened on 9-11, your reaction to what happened on that day, how that has changed your worldview uh, since. And again, I want to review just for a moment what I think we ought to do. I think this is our rational response to Islam. I mean, it's going to sound extreme to people. It sounds exaggerated to people. It sounds hyperbolic. But my point is, if you go back through history, Islam is at war with the West. It has always been at war with the West. It has always been at war with Christ. It has always been at war with Christianity. It has always been at war with Christians. It has always been at war with Christian nations. In fact, 9-11, that date has some great significance in Islamic history. You want to know why they struck on 9-11? Well, there are two dates. There are two decisive defeats of the Muslim armies that happened on September 11. And so on September 11, 1565, the Muslims were turned back by the Knights of Malta at the, isle, uh, at the island of Malta, that island nation. Uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, 1565, he wanted to go right into Italy. He wanted to take control of Rome itself, which, of course, was the capital of Catholic Christianity. And in a lot of ways, people would have considered it kind of the center of, uh, of Christianity around the world. He wanted to go right through Malta, right up to, to Rome, and sack the place and uh, put the flag of the caliphate on top of the Vatican. Uh, he was a Muslim doing that. He got stopped by the Knights of Malta in 1565, even though they were outnumbered. And here's what he said. Here's what the, the leader of the Knights of Malta, his name was Jean Perisot de Lavalette, 70 years old. He's a French guy leading this resistance. He says to this, a formidable army composed of audacious barbarians, is descending on this island. These persons, my brothers, are the enemies of Jesus Christ. Today it is a question of the defense of our faith as to whether the Gospels are to be superseded by the Quran. God, on this occasion, demands of us our lives already vowed to his service. So again, he's not going on the attack against Islam. We are not at war with Islam. But Islam is at war with us, and we must be prepared to respond. Jean Lavalette was. They turned back the, the army, the armada of Suleiman the Magnificent, and he turned tail and left on September 11, 1565. You had another event in 1683. This was the Sultan Mehmed IV. He sent 138,000 Muslims, Ottoman Turks, to surround Vienna, Austria. So they wanted to conquer Europe. And they got to the outskirts of Vienna, Austria in 1683. The Austrian army was led by, uh, or their, their army was led by General Mustafa Pasha. 11,000 Habsburg Austrian defenders. They held off the Muslim armies for two months. Austrian King Leopold I got a message during the attack, the siege by Sultan Mehmed IV, await us in your residence so we can decapitate you. So the Polish king, Jan Sobieski, he gathered 81,000 Polish, Austrian, and German troops to meet this challenge from this, this Muslim sultan, Sultan Mehmed IV. And on September 11, 1683, they led a surprise attack against the Muslim uh, armies, and the Muslim armies fled in confusion. So what the... Muslims were trying to do on 9-11-2001 is reclaim that date. Reclaim September 11 as a date to celebrate Muslim victories rather than to mourn Muslim defeat. So no accident 
that they picked September 11 as the date to attack. Two of their most humiliating defeats came on 9-11. So, again, I think the rational response that we should make as a nation, number one, suspend Muslim immigration. I think there should be no more Muslim immigration. We just simply can't tell the difference. Uh, that Most Muslims are, are, don't represent any threat. I'll be the first one to say it. The vast majority of Muslims do not represent a threat to the safety and security of the American people. The problem is we cannot tell the difference between the ones that have jihad in their hearts and the ones that don't. How do we know? All Hassan's neighbors thought he was a great guy, was a friendly guy. Uh, the Muslim bombers, they were nice guys. They were great to be around. He was a popular kid. He was well-liked. So you just, you just don't know when they're going to develop sudden um, jihad syndrome. We can't tell. So until we find some foolproof way to identify the ones that are carrying jihad in their hearts, the small percentage that do want to destroy us and separate them out from the ones that don't, I believe we just have to be cautious for the sake of our national security with all of them. Then I think, secondly, we should bring the building of mosques to an end. As we've seen, Joseph Story, longest associate justice who sat on the Supreme Court, the first eminent historian of the Constitution, uh, said, look, the First Amendment only prohibits Congress from taking action. The power to regulate religious expression under our Constitution, again, the Constitution as it was given to us by the founders, not the Constitution as it has been mangled by one activist judge after another, but the Constitution as given to us by the founders reserves the entire power. This is what Story said, the whole power of the, over the subject of religion is left exclusively to the state governments to be acted upon according to their own sense of justice and the state constitution. So in other words, the founders in the First Amendment restrained only Congress. Remember, that's the first word of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law. Nobody else is restrained by the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. According to the founders, if we take the Constitution, not as mangled by the courts, but the Constitution as given to us by the founders, Congress and Congress alone is restrained by the First Amendment. The states uh, uh, have all power over the subject of religion. Congress has none. Congress can't interfere. Congress can't tell a state what to do or not to do with regard to regulating religious expression. So this means that the states, if they determine that the religion of Islam represents a threat, its ideology, its totalitarian ideology, represents a threat to the safety and security of the people of their state, then they can ban the building of mosques. They can do it. They have the constitutional power according to the founders, maybe not according to activist courts, but according to the founders, they've got the power to prohibit the building of mosques. And then the third thing is I believe we ought to suspend the practice of having Muslims serve in the United States military. You know, we, we see that with Major uh, Hassan. We have the 13 dead soldiers, 34 injured uh, because we allowed a devoted follower of Allah to serve in the United States military. Once again, it makes no sense to me, makes no sense to me to have people in the United States military who have a sacred obligation to kill us, to destroy their fellow soldiers. And that's what they have. They have a solemn obligation, a sacred obligation to kill their fellow infidel soldiers. I just do not think we ought to take a chance on having people who, whose religion teaches them that that is their highest obligation. It makes no sense to me that people who have a solemn, sacred uh, obligation, according to their holy book and their prophet, to kill us should be in our United States military. Well, let's grab a couple of phone calls before we go to the end of the first hour. Let's go to David in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, David, welcome to Focal Point. What's on your mind? Yes, a uh, couple of things. Just going to say, I actually saw live. I was actually watching GMA was in the background when they first uh, had the first plane talking about it and saw the other one come in live. But uh, my story is, is that my parents were have been missionaries and are now retired for 39 years, and they were actually on one of the last planes, but did not go through New York. They flew into LAX. They were going to visit my brother, so they wow. were just landed earlier that morning, so they made it safely. So wow. I called and checked and see if they made it in, which they did. And then they never changed their plans. This, I think, happened on a Monday, the end of the week, which I believe was Friday when they were on the first plane out of LAX and came to South Mississippi to spend time with me and my family. So this was something that was planned months in advance, six, seven months before this ever took place. 
they never had to change their plans or get their flights changed or anything like that. And one other quick comment, too, just uh, my parents have been missionaries for 39 years. I happened to have been born and grew up overseas, spent the majority of my first 20 years actually in Israel, most of that time in Nazareth. And uh, I have many friends, some that are Jewish, some that are Muslim, some that are actually Jewish, but yet they are converted, so meaning they're Messianic Jews, and even some Muslims that have converted. And the thing to be careful on is I still know some Muslim friends that are born-again Christians, and they still think of themselves as Muslims because they're born into that that's their ancestry. They do not believe in Islam anymore. They turned away from that, so they are born-again uh, Christians. And so that's something where you are doing much better. Like today, you didn't specify we are not war Muslims, we are with Islam. The other thing, real quick, is the word in Arabic for God is Allah. And so born-again believers, Palestinian Arabs and even Muslims that are believers in the Arabic Bible, it does say... Allah. So that is the word for God. So we have to specify by Allah Akbar. That's what the Muslims do say, and they've kind of stolen that. So now Christians cannot say that when they say God is the greatest. But there's other words like Inshallah, meaning God willing. The Christian Arabs say that a lot, and they refer to the God that you and I believe in, not the God of Muhammad. So that's just something just to be aware of. The word Allah is the word God. It doesn't necessarily mean it always refers to the God of the Muslims. All right, David, listen, I appreciate that call very much. Thank you for that information. Focal Point AFR Talk, that's it for the first hour. We'll be right back after the news. Stay with us. <laughs> 